this is the first time I'll be presenting some of this material which is drawn from my research project on complaint. And I want you to know that some of this material is going to involve descriptions of sexual harassment, assault, racism and bullying. The lecture is dedicated to those of you who, whether through formal complaint or some other means, have identified and challenged abuses of power. It is because of the work that you do that we have a chance of getting through. So the title is simple. It's the work that I'm doing on complaint. So my lecture today is an attempt to think through the experience of complaint, to think about that experience, and to think with those who make complaints. I'll be drawing on interviews I've conducted with staff and students who have made complaints within universities that relate to unfair, unjust, or unequal working conditions, or to abuses of power, such as harassment and bullying. I want to give room to complaint to listen to complaint in order to counter a history that has become routine, in which those who complain are dismissed, rendered incredible, unable, unable even to bear witness to their own experiences. One postgraduate student I spoke to who made a complaint about disability discrimination was told in a letter that she had, and this is a direct quote from the letter, misinterpreted her own interpretation. <laughs> the mere fact of making a complaint can be used to cast doubt upon the person who complains. An early career lecturer who made a complaint about how the university mishandled her sick leave was told that her ability to complain was evidence that she was not unwell. <laughs> if I was well enough to stamp my foot and complain, then I was well enough to work. Stamp my foot and complain because she could hear how she was being heard, we too have the opportunity to hear something, how a complaint is audible as a tantrum, how the complainer is cast as spoiled, how a grievance is heard as a grudge. Being able to complain about an oppressive situation is used as evidence that you are not rarely oppressed by that situation. To complain within an organisation so often brings you up against it. So this early career lecturer realised through making the complaint that I wasn't just a person who was off sick. I was a person who had a grievance against the way I had been treated at the university. And in making that complaint, she has to teach herself about how the university works, to show the university how it had failed its own procedures and policies in relation to equality and dignity at work, as well as the management of attendance. She describes what it was like to do that work. It was like a little bird scratching away at something, and it wasn't really having any effect. It was just really small, 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 and behind closed doors. I think people maybe feel that because of the nature of the complaint, and you're off work, so they just have to be polite and not talk about it, and so much of their politeness is because they don't want to say anything. And maybe it is to do with being an institution and the way they are built. Long corridors, doors with locks on them, windows with blinds that come down. It seems to sort of imbue every part of it with a cloistered feeling. There is no air. It feels suffocating. It was like, note this it. A complaint as something you are doing can acquire an exteriority, becoming a thing in the world, scratching away a little bird, all your energy going into an activity that matters so much to what you can do and who you can be, but barely seems to leave any trace. The more you try, the smaller you become. It becomes smaller, small, small, small. A complaint is made confidential as soon as it is lodged, so all of this happens behind closed doors. A complaint as a secret, as a source of shame, as what keeps you apart from others, what is not talked about, private, yours, as you, you too. And note the physicality of the description. A complaint becomes a magnifying glass. So much appears. So many details are picked up by an attention. 
The intensity of an experience can be illuminating. The geography of a place, the building, the long corridors, the locked doors, the windows with blinds that can come down, less light, less room. You cannot breathe, cloistered, suffocating. To make a complaint within an organisation can mean you become even more aware of just how little room you have. So in this lecture, I will approach complaint as a form of diversity work, as a work you have to do in order to be accommodated. Sometimes the work you have to do to be accommodated can make it even harder to be accommodated. So in making a complaint within an institution, you might not begin by thinking of yourself as a critic of the institution or as part of a wider effort to modify, let alone dismantle, its structures. But that is where many who make complaints end up. A complaint about what is going on within a university thus provides us with an alternative catalogue of the university. So I was inspired to do this project after taking part myself in a series of inquiries into sexual harassment and sexual misconduct prompted by a collective complaint lodged by students. I learnt so much from the work that they did to keep a complaint going. Since then, I've interviewed 34 people who've been involved in some way in a formal complaint process at a university, including students, administrators, early career academics, senior academics, and retired academics. So most of my interviewees got in touch with me through my website, and I'll return to this aspect of my data collection in my conclusion. And most of these interviews have been based where I'm based, in the UK. Although I have finished collecting the data, at least for this project, living a feminist life is data collection, I'm not yet ready to draw firm conclusions. And perhaps I won't ever be ready. What I hope to convey is live. It is happening now. All around us there are explosions, acts of speaking out and speaking back. Me Too is about giving complaints somewhere to go. So my lecture is thinking with those I spoke to, the complainers are my guides. They are my feminist philosophers, my critical theorists, also my collective. Because this material is confidential, many of those I have spoken to would fear the consequences for their lives and careers if they were recognisable from the data. I'll be sharing only fragments from each story. A complaint can be shattering, like a broken jug, we can be left in pieces. I'll be picking up some of those pieces today, not in order to create the illusion of some unbroken thing, but so that we can learn from the sharpness of each piece how they fit together. So the first section is called Institutional Mechanics. So why think of complaint as diversity work? By diversity work, we might be thinking about the work of trying to open up institutions to populations that had hitherto been excluded. I first wrote about diversity work in On Being Included, drawing on interviews with equal opportunity and diversity practitioners based in Australian and British universities. Most practitioners are appointed by organisations to transform them. But being appointed by an institution to transform it does not mean that the institution is willing to be transformed. So how diversity is used by organisations can even become a sign of the difficulty of getting through. So one practitioner described diversity as a big shiny apple with a rotten core. <laughs> it all looks wonderful, right? But the inequalities aren't being addressed. This practitioner described her work thus, it's a banging your head against a brick wall job. So here a job description becomes a wall description. And if you bang away at that wall and the wall keeps its place, you end up with a sore head. And what happens to the wall, all you seem to have done is scratch the surface. And this is what diversity work often feels like, scratching the surface, scratching at the surface. And we can think back to the image of the complaint as a little bird scratching away at something without really having an effect. 
It is because it is hard to get through that diversity work can be thought of as mechanical. You have to work out how you are blocked. You have to work out how the system is working to stop you. Making a complaint also requires becoming an institutional mechanic. You have to work out how to get a complaint through a system. It is because of the difficulty of getting through that the complaint often ends up being about the system. Now, this point might seem counterintuitive given that organisations do have complaints procedures. Surely, to make a complaint is to follow the procedure for making that complaint. In fact, listening to those who have made or who, who have tried to make formal complaints has taught me that the gap between what is supposed to happen and what does happen is densely populated. So a complaint is a kind of mind the gap. Many universities in the UK include as part of their complaint policies a discussion of how they will record and monitor complaints. So one university writes that complaints will assist in identifying problems and trends across the university. And a typical way that complaints are described is as data, the data that's supposed to tell you what's wrong, what's going wrong. They then write that complaints will form the basis of positive publicity in demonstrating that identified issues have been resolved. <laughs> so when a complaint records a problem, a complaint can be quickly folded into a solution, a solution, a record of how universities have resolved something, so resolution, dissolution, which sort of means that complaints can be used rather like diversity as a way of appearing to address a problem. A complaint procedure is often represented as a flow chart, especially for student complaints. <laughs> flow, flow, away we go. <laughs> With paths and arrows that give the would-be complainant a route through. So I spoke to one administrator about her work in supporting students through a complaint process. So your first stage would require the complainant to try and resolve it informally which is really difficult in some situations and which is where it might get stuck in a department. And so it takes a really tenacious complaining student to say, no, I'm being blocked. If something bad has happened and you're not feeling that way inclined, you can understand why a student would not have the tenacity to make sure that happens and to advocate for themselves. So you can imagine that something on paper that looks very linear is actually very circular a lot of the time. And I think that's the problem. Students get discouraged and get demoralised and feel hard done by and nothing's getting resolved and then they are in a murky place and they can't get out. So if a procedure exists in order to clear a path, that path can be blocked at any point. And a complaint is not simply an outcome of a no. A complaint requires you keep saying no along the way. So this practitioner acknowledges that what is required to proceed with a complaint in her terms, confidence and tenacity, might be what is eroded by the very experiences that led to complaint, something bad has happened, not feeling that way inclined. So unsurprisingly then, stopping is part of the life course of many complaints. A problem identified in a number of my interviews is the relative inaccessibility of complaint procedures. One student described, it took us forever to try and find the complaints procedure PDF on the database. We knew it existed, but it was like a mythical golden egg. We just couldn't find it. And then when we did, it was so big that even two PhD students spent weeks trying to get through the small print to find out what the complaint process was. So if you can't find the policy, you cannot follow the path laid out as procedure. Or if you do find it, but it is hard to use, you might not make it to the next step. So a would-be complainer is one who has taken some steps in the direction of a formal complaint, perhaps by making an informal disclosure to a line manager, a supervisor or peer. And many complaints are stopped at this point through the use of warnings. A warning is an ominous sign, a sign of the danger to come. Warnings are useful because they articulate a no, don't go that way predicated not on some abstract rule, but on the complainer's own health and safety. 
Think of how the sign on the left is more effective as well as affective instruction. You would topple over. One student describes, I was repeatedly told that rocking the boat or making waves would affect my career in the future, and that I would ruin the department for everyone else. I was told if I did put in a complaint, I would never be able to work in the university, and that it was likely I wouldn't get a job elsewhere. So complaining here is framed as self-damage, as well as damage to others, ruining a department no less. And this student describes how the pressure not to complain was exerted. In just one day, I was subjected to eight hours of gruelling meetings and questioning, almost designed to break me and stop me from taking the complaint any further. You can stop people from doing something by making it harder for them to do something. A warning can operate not simply as a predictive utterance, but also as a threat. This student commented on how the head department made reference in the meeting to her source of funding. To be reminded of how she is dependent upon the department for resources is to be told how the department can make her topple over, a warning as a threat. Now, not all warnings operate as threats in quite this way. Warnings are often spoken in the language of care and concern. Another student describes, I ended up going back to the chair and saying, look, this is harassment, and I'm going to file a complaint. And his response was essentially, well, we are just thinking about your career, how this will affect you in the future. The implication is that to proceed with a formal complaint is not to think about your career. Being advised not to complain is offered as career advice. And your career is almost evoked as a companion who needs to be looked after. So maybe your career is a plant that needs watering so that it does not wither away. So if your career would wither as a consequence of complaining, then a complaint is figured in advance as carelessness, as negligence, as not looking after yourself properly. <coughs> if warnings are used to discourage a certain course of action, they can also function as positive directives. You might be encouraged not to make a complaint. Indeed, one academic described this approach as the default setting, the default academia thing, the university thing. It will be fine if we do wait. Don't make a fuss. So not making a complaint becomes a form of virtue and even good citizenship. Patience is tied to a positive outlook, as if the best way to approach a wrong is to assume that it will right itself in time. The flip side of a warning is thus a promise, an institutional version of what I call the promise of happiness, a promise that if you don't complain, you will go further. Complaints can also be stopped by the very appearance of being heard. One student talked to her head of department. She says, he seemed to take it on board. He was listening. He was nodding. Ten days later, I still had not heard anything. A space of limbo opened up. If a nod is followed by inaction, inaction is an action. A nod can operate in the realm of the non-performative. In my earlier work, I introduced the category of the non-performative to refer primarily to speech acts that do not bring into effect what they name, or even which name something in order not to bring it into effect. And my example was a university that eventually agreed to a diversity policy, but the policy doesn't come into use. So agreeing to something is a way of stopping it from happening. If a nod can be a non-performative, a body too can be in on the act. That is, a body can appear to act without doing anything or in order not to do anything. So, an academic brings a complaint to her line manager. I would say he's a yes man. So whenever I talked to him, he would say yes, but I knew the yes was definitely not a yes. It was a we'll see. So perhaps a yes can be said because or even when there is nothing behind it. She describes this yes saying as a management technique. This weird, almost magical thing that happens when you speak to people in management, when you go in there and you're kind of ready for it and you're really fired up and you kind of put your complaint, your case, your story to the person and then you sort of leave as if a spell has been cast. 
leaving, like, okay, something might happen. And then that kind of wears off a few hours later and you think, oh my gosh. It's like a sleight of hands, almost like a, a trick. You feel tricked. So here a yes, a nod, can stop a complaint from progressing by diffusing the energy of the one who complains. Another academic describes what followed when students made a complaint about the behavior of professors at research events. They set up a meeting. They said they would have an open meeting, but it was just about calming the students down. So I think of this as venting, and that can be used as a technique of preventing something more explosive from happening. You let a complaint be expressed in order that it can be contained. So once the students have vented their frustrations, once they have got the complaint out of their system, the complaint is out of the system. I think of this mechanism as rather like a pressure relief valve, which lets off just enough pressure so that it does not build up and cause an explosion. I'll return to explosions later. So another method of stopping a complaint is to declare that a complaint is not a complaint because it does not fulfill the technical requirements for being a complaint. This is very common, actually. So, for example, a member of staff made a complaint about bullying from her head of department. That experience of bullying had been devastating and she'd suffered from depression as a result. So it took her a long time to get to the point where she could write a complaint. Sometimes the experiences that we need to complain about are the experiences that make it difficult to complain. So she describes what happens when she was able to put her complaint in. I basically did it when I was able to because I was just really unwell for a significant period of time. And I put in that complaint and the response that I got was from the deputy VC. He said that he couldn't process my complaint because I had taken too long to lodge it. So some experiences are so devastating that it takes time to process them and the length of time taken can then be used to disqualify a complaint. So the tightening of the complaint as genre, a complaint as the requirement to fill it in a form in a certain way at a certain time, is how many struggles are not recorded. If organisations can disqualify complaints because they take too long to make, they can also take too long to respond to complaints. One student describes how her university took seven months to respond to her complaint, it was supposed to take three, and then another seven months to respond to her response to their response to her complaint. She has a theory. It is my theory they've been putting in the long finger and pulling this out, dragging this out over unacceptable periods of time to try and tire me out so they'll just give up. Sometimes it can seem that exhaustion is not just the effect, but the very point of a complaint process. Exhaustion can be a management technique. You tire people out so they are too tired to address what makes them too tired. I've also been tempted to call this phenomena strategic inefficiency. We might think of inefficiency as annoying, but indiscriminate, affecting everyone and everything. Listening to those who've complained has taught me that inefficiency can be discriminatory. An international student was waiting for her complaint to be processed whilst her visa was running out. Ten days before my visa was about to run out, I applied for a new visa. And they were like, how can we give her a visa? She's on probation. You have to have good standing to get a visa. And they were like, this complaint thing is open. For students and staff who are more precarious because of their residential or financial status, the longer a complaint is kept open, the more you have to lose. I would speculate that there is a connection between the discriminatory effects of inefficiency and the efficiency with which organisations reproduce themselves as being for certain kinds of people, those whose papers are in the right place those who are in the right place, those who are upright, able, well-resourced, <laughs> well-connected, those who have the least need to complain are then those who could most handle the consequences of complaint. Well, you can lodge a complaint and still nothing happens. Perhaps the complaints end up in a filing cabinet, filing as filing away, 
One student said of her complaint, it gets shoved in the box. Another student described, I feel like my complaint has gone into the complaint graveyard. When a complaint is filed away or binned or buried, those who complain can end up feeling that they too are filed away or binned or buried. We need to remember here that a complaint is a record of what happens to a person. Complaints are personal. They are also records of what happens in an institution. Complaints are institutional. The personal is institutional. One academic researcher shared her complaint file with me. One of the things I talked about in those documents, I am very open, I was under such stress and trauma that my period stopped. That's the intimacy of some of the things that go into it. Bodily functions like this. A body can stop functioning. A body can announce a complaint. That body is in a document. And that document is in a file. And that file is in a cabinet. To file a complaint can mean to become alienated from your own history. A history that is often alienating already. A history that is difficult, painful, and traumatic. This second section is called In the Thick of It. Oh, oops. <laughs> so I focused thus far on what happens to a complaint, on the mechanisms by which complaints are stopped. But complaints are not the starting points. If complaints are about what precedes them, complaints take us back. And what I want to do in this section is to back up. So one student gives an account of turning up at a postgraduate retreat. They were making jokes, jokes that were horrific. They were doing it in a very small space in front of staff and nobody was saying anything. And it felt like my reaction to it was out of kilter with everyone else. It felt really disconnected, the way I felt about the way they were behaving and the way everybody else was laughing. They were talking about milking bitches. I still can't quite get to the bottom of where the jokes were coming from. Nobody was saying anything about it. People were just laughing along. You start to stand out in that way. You were just not playing along. That sexist expression, milking bitches, seems to have a history. And each time that expression is used, that history is thrown out like a line, a line you have to follow if you are to get anywhere. When laughter fills the room like water in a cup, laughter as holding something, it can feel like there's no room left. To experience such jokes as offensive is to become alienated, not only from the jokes, but the laughter that surrounds them, propping them up, giving them somewhere to go. And just by not laughing, not going along with something, she starts to stand out. I think this is very important. A complaint can be registered before anything is even said, expressed by how a body is not attuned to an environment. To express can mean to squeeze something out. And sometimes a complaint seems to seep out, rather like liquid oozing through the crack in a wall. In another instance, a junior female lecturer was sexually harassed by a senior male professor, mainly through constant verbal communications. He, he emailed her about wanting to suck her toes, for instance. She thought she'd handle this by asking her line manager to ask him to stop, not knowing that her line manager had sat on that request. So when an attempt to stop harassment is stopped, harassment does not stop. And then I was in a meeting with my line manager and her line manager, and we were in this little office space, like a glass fishbowl type meeting room, and then the main office where all the staff desks were, and he emailed me, and I made a sound, ah! There's no way to articulate it. Someone's just dragging your insides like a meat grinder. Oh, God, this is not going to stop. And I made that sound out loud. And my line manager, the line manager, said, what's happened? And I turned my computer around and showed him, and he said, for fuck's sake, how stupid do you have to be to put that in an email? You could see a look of panic on her face. Like, crap, this has not magically gone away. That sound that, ah, uh, pierces the meeting. That meeting taking place in the little glass room, a fishbowl, where they can all be seen. Something can become visible and audible, sometimes even despite yourself. 
A complaint is what comes out because you can't take it anymore. You just can't take it anymore. Your inside's like a meat grinder. A complaint is how you're turned inside out. This also means, of course, that a complaint can acquire a life of its own. The email, in fact, was read by others, her sound becoming an alert, leading to a formal complaint process that she herself did not initiate. And note how the problem once acknowledged is implied to be not so much the harassment, but that there was evidence of it. For fuck's sake, how stupid do you have to be to put that in an email? And a sound becomes a complaint because it brings to the surface a violence that would otherwise not have to be faced. And so, a complaint teaches us about how violence is often dealt with by not being faced, and those who face up to violence end up being on the receiving end. Going back to the case of the postgraduate student, it is because she experienced a set of behaviours and speeches as violent, as being unacceptable, that the violence gets rechanneled in her direction. He specifically went for me verbally at a table where everyone was eating lunch. It was a large table with numerous amounts of people around it, including staff. I was having quite a personal conversation with someone. And he literally leant across the table or physically came forward. He was slightly ajar to me. He was really close. And he said, oh my God, I can see you ovulating. Because she had not found the jokes funny, because she expressed that she was not condoning the behaviour, because she was not happy with what was going on, he comes after her. Her personal space invaded, words flung out, flung at. She is reduced to body pulled back, woman as ovary. She's not allowed to do her own thing to have a conversation with others, to be occupied as a student. Words can be how spaces are occupied and how bodies can take up those spaces as if those spaces belong to them. She describes what followed in the experience. I think the staff member knew I was deeply upset by it. I pretty much left the table and he, the staff member, followed me out and started a conversation. This is when probably in hindsight it started to get difficult. In that staff member started to lean on me, immediately he said to me, oh, you know what, he's like, he's got a really strange sense of humour, he didn't mean anything by it. And the implication was I was being a bit oversensitive and that I couldn't take a joke and that I need to sort of forget about it and move on. So note then that the effort to stop the student from complaining about the situation is made in the situation before the complaint ever materialise. She is told not to say anything, not to be ever sensitive, not to do anything, not to cause trouble. And note too how those who identify harassment as harassment are harassed all the more. The staff member, by, by leaning in this way, positions himself with the harasser, treating the verbal onslaught as a joke, something she should just take and keep taking. So the harasser, harasser physically comes forward, the staff member leans on her. The response to harassment is harassment. That is the institutional response. Harassment can be the attempt to try to stop someone from identifying harassment. This powerful testimony teaches us how complaint is right in the middle of something, right in the thick of it. A complaint is thus imminent. It is what you have to do because of how spaces are occupied. This is why the experiences that lead to complaint and the experiences of complaint are hard to untangle. They are often part of the very same experience. Sometimes you might have to make a complaint in order even to be able to enter a room. One academic describes how she has to keep pointing out that rooms are inaccessible because they keep booking rooms that are inaccessible. She has to keep saying it because they keep doing it. I worry about drawing attention to myself, but this is what happens when you hire a person in a wheelchair. There have been major access issues at the university. She spoke of the drain, the exhaustion, the sense of why should I have to be the one who speaks out? You have to speak out because others do not. And because you speak out, others can justify their own silence, they hear you. So it becomes about you. Major access issues become your issues. And a complaint is then treated as a broken record. 
as if she is the one who was stuck on the same point. If you do speak out, you end up standing out. A complaint then can be how you are heard. You are heard as complaining when you identify a problem. And to hear someone as making a complaint can be how that problem is smoothed over. You hear them so you don't hear what it is they are trying to address. Audre Lorde showed how speaking about race or racism, as women of colour say, is often heard as getting in the way of smooth communication. If women of colour use the word racism, we are heard as complaining. Racism as such is heard as complaint. One woman of colour academic describes to me, I was on the equality and diversity group in the university, and as soon as I started mentioning things to do with race, they changed the portfolio of who could be on the committee, and I was dropped. So if we do end up on those diversity committees, we are supposed to do that work with a smile. In other words, our job becomes to smooth things over. Smoothing things over requires removing traces of histories that get in the way of an occupation of space. She adds, whenever you raise something, the response is that you're not one of them. Not one of them. It's almost as if a complaint amplifies what makes you not fit, picking up what you are not. And then a complaint about how some do not belong can be used as evidence that some do not belong. If you have to complain to enter a room or to stay in that room, you are complaining about a structure, not an event, or a structure as well as an event. Some have to complain about the very structures that enable the progression of others. So a complaint might begin then with a feeling of structure. You notice a structure when it stops you from entering a room or being seated at a table. It can hit you like a wall. And here resides yet another difficulty, which I would describe as a life difficulty. If we were to complain about structures, we would be complaining all the time. And maybe that's what sometimes it feels like what we're doing. But sometimes then, because it's exhausting, in order to do that work, our work, we might ourselves make use of files, putting aside what, it, what makes it difficult to do the work. So a woman attends a meeting for senior managers. She's the only woman at the table, but she's used to this. She's got used to this. This is business as usual. The usual is the structural in temporal form. But then one of the men at the table makes a sexist and sexualizing comment about chasing a woman around the darkroom. She described how the comment became a bonding moment between men, how the atmosphere in the room changed, laughter, interest, as if they'd all been brought to attention. After expressing her feelings to me of rage, alienation, disappointment, but also of sadness, she said, you fight it under, don't go there. And this is what many of us do or try to do to keep going. We might put aside what is hardest to handle, creating our own complaint files. Of course, our own complaint files are full of what we have already noticed. The file, don't go there, tells us where we have been. So earlier I introduced the figure of the would-be complainer as the one who has indicated to themselves or to others that they are considering filing a complaint. But you can become the complainer without giving any such indication. It can be hard to do certain kinds of political or institutional work without being heard as a complainer. So that figure can be a file. The complainer is a rather stuffed file. And then, if you do file a complaint, you are, as it were, already inhabiting that file. You are, as it were, confirming a judgment about you that has already been made. As Leela Whitley and Tiffany Page have observed, have observed, when a woman files an objection to sexual harassment, she becomes, in the language of the institution, a woman who complains and, by extension, a complainer. And in becoming a complainer, you can hear how the organisation hears you, and you can end up internalising that voice, doubting yourself. An early career lecturer describes, I've been told I have a chip on my shoulder, that I've got a chip on my shoulder because I am Jewish, 
that I have a chip on my shoulder because I'm foreign, living in this country and you're upset about Brexit, or because you're gay and you're just looking for the problems. And you start thinking, am I looking for these problems? I just turn it inwards. Is it me? Is it my fault? I lie away at night thinking, is it actually a problem with me here? Chip, chip, chip. If we chip away at the old block, no wonder they find that chip on our shoulders. But if you keep having a problem, you can still end up feeling like the problem is with you. Another academic describes how becoming a complainer can then take you away from your work. If you have a situation and you make a complaint, then you are the woman who complains, the lesbian who complains, and it gets in the way of being in the role, being a good colleague, a good mentor, a great teacher, a supervisor. And you can feel the change in your voice and the dynamic in meetings. And you don't like to hear yourself talking like that, but you end up being in that situation again. And you think, it's me. And you think, no, it's systematic. And you think, it's me. <laughs> that conversation you have with yourself, it's me, it's the system, it's me, it's the system, that conversation takes time. And it can feel like everything just ends up spinning around. Spinning, spilling. Maybe you reach a point, a breaking point, where you might fly off the handle, rather like that broken cup, and it all just spills out. She describes further, and then, of course, you get witch-hunted, you get scapegoat, you become the troublesome uppity woman, you become the woman who does not fit, you become everything the bully accuses you of because nobody's listening to you. And you hear yourself starting to take that not petulant tone, bangs table, come on. You can hear them saying, oh, there you go. A diversity practitioner said something very similar to me, that she only had to open her mouth in meetings to witness eyes rolling as if to say, oh, here she goes. Both times we laughed. It can be a relief to have an experience put into words. The feminist killjoy, that leaky container, she comes up here. She comes up in what we can hear. We hear each other in the wear and the tear of the words we share. We hear what it's like to come up against the same thing over and over again. It was from experiences like this that I developed my equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. <laughs> So this next section is called Closing the Door. I open my lecture by showing how complaint can lead to an institution being registered all the more intensely, the corridors, the windows with blinds that come down, glass walls, brick walls, tables, chairs, doors with locks on them. In fact, doors keep coming up in my data. So many of my interviewees describe how complaints happen behind closed doors. If complaint provides data, that data is kept under lock and key. I am speaking to an academic about the first complaint she made when she was a student. One of her lecturers on her course had been making her feel uncomfortable, and one time she enters his room. And then one time I went into his office to talk to him about something. It was an office a bit like this, but without any glass, with a door that opened inwards and opened on a latch, and he pushed me up against the back of the door and tried to kiss me, and I pushed him away. It was an instinct to push him away and try to get out of the room, and it was a horrible moment because I realised I couldn't actually. It was very difficult to operate the latch. We are back to the door, the back of the door. A door without glass, solid, can't be seen through. A door is what you are pushed against. The latch that won't open, getting stuck, trying to get out. The work you have to do to get out. She did get out of the room, but it was hard. Behind closed doors, harassment happens there, out of view, in secret. You can be locked in, locked out. Doors have something else to teach us. They teach us the significance of a complaint about harassment being lodged in the same place where the harassment happened. A door is shut on her, and the same door is shut on a complaint. The same door. She submits an informal complaint, a letter detailing the assault. And where does her complaint go? Her letter ends up with the dean. And what does the dean do? The dean basically told me, I should sit down and have a cup of tea with the guy to sort it out. So often a response to a complaint about harassment is to minimise harassment as if what occurred is just a minor squabble between two parties, something that can be sorted out by a cup of tea, that English signifier of reconciliation. 
A complaint then will become our failure, your failure, to resolve the situation more amicably. She does not proceed to a formal complaint. Her complaint was stopped. He was not. Now, I say her complaint was stopped rather than she was stopped because she did go on to have a career. She is now a professor. But this experience of being assaulted when she was a student stayed with her. She described, I thought I got a first because of academic merit, but then after this thing happened, I remember thinking, but hang on, maybe not. Maybe this was some sort of ruse to try and keep me in, in, in the institution so he could keep the contact going. It starts undermining your own sense of your academic merit, the quality of your work, and all that kind of stuff. Being harassed by a lecturer damages your sense of self-worth, intellectual worth, leading you to question yourself, doubt yourself. Her complaint was stopped. She was not, but she carries that history with her. Her complaint was stopped. He was not. What happened to him? She tells us. He was a known harasser. There were lots of stories about him. I had a friend who was very vulnerable. He took advantage of that. She ended up taking her own life. She ended up taking her own life, so much more pain, so much more damage at the edges of one woman's story of damage. He went on. He was allowed to go on when her complaint, and for all we know, there were others too. We do not know how many said no, did not stop him. And he has since retired, much respected by his peers, no blemish on his record. No blemish on his record, no blemish on the institution's record. The damage carried by those who did complain or would complain if they could complain is carried around like baggage, slow, heavy down. To hear complaint is to hear from those weighed down by a history that has left little trace in the official records. And organisations become aligned with those who abuse the power given to them by virtue of position because they share an interest in stopping what is recorded by the complaint from getting out. So damage to a person is deflected by being treated as damage to the institution or damage to a person if a person is indeed identified by a complaint. And that damage is often evoked through or as concern, as concern for the consequences for how much he or they would have to lose reputation, status, standing, and so on. This concern for the consequences of complaint can manifest as a concern for a shared project or program. One student who complained about bullying and harassment from other students on her program was told, you are endangering the director's job, you're endangering the whole ESSC funding, you are going to ruin any chance for this innovative work continuing. So when a program is understood as innovative or even radical, a complaint can be treated as conservative or even reactionary as an attempt to stop something innovative from happening. If exposing bullying or harassment would threaten a program, there is a problem with the program, but you can still be made to feel that to expose the problem would endanger the program. The image of a person or a program as critical or radical can be useful as it enables complaints to be dismissed as disciplinary or management techniques. This is why it is just too easy and even wrong to identify management or human resources as the source of some of the problems I'm describing. That identification can even be another way that complaints are stopped. In other words, academic networks are protected by identifying complaints with the management of those networks. So many of those I spoke to described meetings of heads of department or deans where there is a sustained attempt to stop them from making a complaint. I've shared such stories with you already. Now, we could interpret these meetings as evidence of top-down bullying from management, and that does go on, but that will still only capture some of what is going on. Heads of department and deans, indeed, might be operating not only as managers, but also as colleagues, and sometimes even as close personal friends of those whose conduct is under question. And this is where it gets hard. So another example. A black woman academic was being racially harassed and bullied by a white woman colleague. But when she complains, this is familiar, she is the one who is vilified. 
And so my complaint then became me being vilified internally. I became the woman who told a lie. That's me, told a lie, because that couldn't have possibly happened because this wonderful white woman is such a nice person. She's completely non-racist. She would never say such a thing. And she kind of walked around crying all the time, looking very upset. Later, when another white colleague becomes her head of department, that colleague says, I want you to reconcile with her because after all, she's my friend and colleague, and all she ever did was write you some long emails. She is my friend. Racial harassment can be reduced here to just a style of communication, just a few long emails. And a complaint about racism becomes damage to a friend. And an expression of desire for recon reconciliation, it might appear as a friendly gesture, but there is nothing friendly about this gesture. If a black woman does not return the desire for reconciliation, if she's not willing to smooth things over, moving on as getting on, she becomes mean, the one who has not only broken a connection, but refused to repair it. So whiteness then operates as a web of live connections, and sympathy as such is distributed. Sympathy becomes part of the machinery, friendly-like. A machine can be built then from past allegiances. So complaints about harassment are not only received by those who share allegiances, but those allegiances are often explicitly brought up, sending a clear message to the complainer about how their complaint will be received. When a student made a complaint after being sexually assaulted by a lecturer, he had forced himself on her in his office after locking the door she is called to a meeting with three women professors and a male dean. And she describes the meeting for us. One, the professor said last thing, for instance, ah, he's always like this, isn't he? Always very seductive and funny. He's always been like this since we were studying together. He also touches me when talking, what so? While the other was saying, ah, I've known him so many years, it must be some misunderstanding for sure. While the other was just smiling and nodding before even having heard what I had to say. A history can be casually evoked. Studying together, I have known him for years. A complaint about assault dismissed as misunderstanding, smiling, nodding. It is right. He is right. You are wrong. You are wronging him. And a complaint then can be stopped because of what is shared, because of who is shared. Friendships, loyalties, personal and professional. Affection becoming like cement in a wall. A bond, a bind, be kind. He is one of a kind, one of our kind. So by closing the door, really we're also talking about closing ranks. When you're shown the back of a door, their backs have become doors. As another student described, they have each other's backs. And these historical connections, they are kept alive as communication pathways, how information is passed down the line where it gets stopped. A complaint functions rather like a switch, an alarm or an alert that triggers a reaction. A complaint is how a network comes alive to protect those who are the most networked. You can almost hear the buzz of electricity or the phone lines becoming busy. The more someone is connected, the more others become invested in that connection. So a complaint is threatening an investment. One student who participated in a collective complaint about harassment from a professor describes, we were accused of having caused a disruption in their studies. They valued their desire to have him as a professor over those who were suffering psychologically because of his harassment. We needed to be in solidarity with those whose education was now being disrupted, not the other way around. So a complaint is framed then as a loose connection, as a lack of solidarity with others who are cut off from a source of information and energy. And indeed, I, I think we could think of the feminist killjoy as a loose connection, almost like faulty wiring, causing damage by virtue of not being properly attached. You can also experience complaint as having to become your own killjoy. One PhD student described how hard it was to recognize that she was being harassed by her supervisor, who was otherwise giving her helpful feedback, and she recognised that only once he reached a certain point, he started sending her photographs of his genitals. And she said, I felt like I would take myself down by admitting to the kind of violence he was enacting. Take myself down. When you admit to that violence, it becomes real, 
for you, such that you can feel that you've stopped yourself from doing what you need to progress. And complaints have so much to teach us about progression. When one MA student made a complaint about the conduct of the most senior member of her department, she's told by the convener of the program, be careful, he is an important man. Be careful, a warning not to proceed is a statement about who is important. Importance is not just a judgment, it is a direction. And a professor becomes a conductor. Information, energy and resources travel through him. I would describe this becoming as institutional funneling. Paths become narrower and narrower at the exit points, so you might have to go through this professor to get anywhere. This student went ahead with her complaint. In her terms, she sacrificed the references. And in reference to the prospect of doing a PhD, she said, that door is closed. That door is closed. References, too, can function as doors mechanisms that enable an opening or closing, how it is made possible for some to progress, others not. Reference systems are paper trails, letters sent out. They are how some are enabled by the connections, how they gather speed and velocity more and more, faster and faster. He is an important man. Many do not make complaints because they feel they cannot afford to lose the references, to lose the connections. And note also then that the punishment for complaint can entail the mere withdrawal of support. To withdraw support is enough to stop someone from getting somewhere. A complaint about an abuse of power teaches us about power. It teaches us how power can work through what seems like a very light touch. The mere lift of a supportive hand can function as the heaviest of weights, <coughs> stopping someone, slowing them down. A complaint this teaches us how the more a power is dispersed, the more a power is dispersed through a network, the more it gets concentrated in certain hands. A complaint teaches us how power manifests as the withdrawal of support for those who show how power manifests. And a complaint teaches us how power works by increasing the costs of challenging how power works. Complaints have a lot to teach us. This is my conclu conclusion. It's called Complaint Collective. In order to proceed with or to complaint, we often have to form a collective. One more example from my research. A woman of colour sets up a writing group in her department. The meetings became dominated by senior men. What I found in each of the meetings were senior men who were bullying everyone in the room. The bullying took the form of the constant belittling of the work of more junior academics as well as postgraduate students. The first session, someone was just really being abusive about someone's PhD, saying it was rubbish. Racist comments are made. I'm from London, and London is just ripe for ethnic cleansing. She described how people laughed and how that laughter filled the room. She comments on these comments. These were the sorts of things being aired. These were the sorts of things being aired. Even the air can be occupied. She decides to make a complaint because she wanted it recorded and because the culture was being reproduced for new PhD students. So a complaint becomes a recording device. You have to record what you do not want to reproduce. So she gathers statements from 20 people in her department. A complaint can be a collective. A meeting is set up in response to a complaint. And at that meeting, she was described by the head of human resources as having a chip on her shoulder, that chip coming up again, as if she's complaining because she's sore. She adds, they treated the submission as an act of arrogance on my part. It is as if she put the complaint forward as a way of putting herself forward. A complaint is treated as self-promotional. A feminist we can be still heard as me. When those who try to stop a culture from being reproduced are stopped, a culture is being reproduced. But if we try to stop something and we are stopped, we know stuff. There is an intimacy between how much we know and how we work together. We know that the engine of social reproduction only appears to run effort effortlessly. We know what it takes to keep things running. The early career lecturer whose description of making a complaint as a little bird scratching away at something I began with spoke of how her complaint led her to find out about other complaints. It was quite amazing, actually, 
to find that in my department there were more than a handful of staff who were there complaining about the same issues. But all of us were doing it, not in silence, but in an atomised way, so that none of us knew actually that we were all having similar problems and we were making similar complaints. A complaint is how you come to identify a problem that is shared, similar complaints, similar problems. The process, the procedures, are designed to treat us like atoms kept small by being kept apart, but how we combine, how we combine. My own complaint project came out of how we combined our forces. When I made the reasons for my resignation public, I shared information, not actually very much, but just enough that there had been these inquiries, that they had taken place. And I became a leak, drip, drip. Organisations will try and contain that damage. This is how public relations works as damage limitation. And this is how diversity often takes institutional form as damage limitation. Happy, shiny policies will be put in place, holes left by departures will be filled without reference to what went on before, a block becoming something to be wiped up and wiped away, mopping up a mess. But there is hope here, because they cannot mop up all of our mess. A leak can be a lead. A leak can be a feminist lead. By becoming a leak, I became easier to find. People came to me with their complaints. That we find each other through complaint is a finding. So it might seem that complaints that do not get anywhere disappear without a trace. But in saying no, we keep a history alive. We do not let go. Those scratches on the wall, they are what we leave behind. Even when our complaints lead us to leave, we leave something of ourselves behind by complaining. At the time, those scratches seemed only to show the limits of what we accomplished. But what appears as scratch and scribble like that sound, remember that, ugh, they can be testimony. We hear a no in a scramble of letters. A complaint becomes writing on the wall. We can hear. We are here. We did not get used to it. So even complaints that do not get anywhere, they can lead us to each other. A postgraduate student made an informal complaint about white supremacy in her classroom Using that kind of term for what is here at the university can get you in serious trouble. She knew that, but she was willing to do that. And she became, in her terms, a monster, an indigenous feminist monster, and she is now completing her PhD off campus. But she said that an unexpected little gift was how other students could come to her. They know you are out there, and they can reach out to you. So complaints become a kind of transgenerational intimacy, an alternative communication network. Not all complaint collectors are made up of those who are physically present, who are in the same place at the same time, and yet we combine. We combine our forces. To complain is to lift a lid. The more complaints are suppressed, and to suppress is to restrain and restrict as well as to keep something secret. The more spills out. It can be explosive what comes out. Even what or who has been binned or buried can acquire a life. Those complaints in the graveyard can come back to haunt institutions. It is a promise. Thank you. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world. <laughs>